بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome dear brothers and sisters to this beautiful night of worship where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen us to be amongst the people that the angels surround and praise as we get together to seek beneficial knowledge, striving to get better for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Falhamdulillahi ala dhalik. Tonight, we have been graced once again by one of the most renowned scholars, our beloved Shaykh Asim Luqman al-Hakim. Our beloved Sheikh will be discussing the topic of preserving one's identity. So without further ado, please welcome to the mic, Sheikh Asim. So alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man ihtada bi huda. Amma ba'du, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this blessed night where we shall, inshallah, discuss the topic at hand, which is a very important topic, not to our religion only, but rather to the existence, to our existence in this world, in this cosmopolitan world that we live in. If you remember, we recite two surahs in the Sunnah of Fajr, in the Sunnah of after Tawaf, in the Sunnah of Maghrib, and in Witr prayers in the last two rakahs of the three rakahs Witr. One of these surahs is the famous surah, Surah Al Kafirun. And it, everybody knows it by heart. And if you look at this surah, you find it emphasizing a very important fact in Islam. This fact is that we as Muslims have our own identity, have our own religion, have our own way, and that cannot be mixed with other ways. Allah says, say, O oh disbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, nor are you worshipers of what I worship, nor you will, will I be a worshiper of what you worship, nor you will be or, uh, 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 worshipers of what I worship, for you is your religion and for me is my religion. You imagine that we repeat this surah throughout the day a number of times. And it's part of the bedtime athkar. So that we recite it before going to bed. Because it signifies our identity, our religion, the way we deal with ourselves and the community around us. A Muslim's identity is unique. Because we pride ourselves to be on the straight path, which Allah has chosen for us. We recite in Al-Fatiha, not less than 17 times a day, not less. Stating our identity, when we say, guide us to the straight path. We ask Allah to guide us to the straight path. The path of those upon whom you have bestowed favor. Not those who you have, who have earned your anger or those who are astray. So our identity on the straight path is different than those who had earned Allah's anger. And these are the Jews. Nor those who have went astray. And these are the Christians. 
we identify this and recite it and acknowledge it. So the issue of having our own identity that is unique, that make us stand out in a crowd, this is an essential part of our religion. And that is why it is a well-known fact that Muslims are ordered to go against other denominations, all other religions, in our conviction, in our beliefs, in our traditions, in whatever they are known of, such as their customs, their traditions, their attire, and the general hadith of the Prophet ﷺ highlights this when he said, "Woman And whoever imitates a people, he is part of them. This is a very strong warning for those who have lost their identity. Whoever imitates a people if you look at the Muslims nowadays, the vast majority of them are confused. They have mixed opinions of things to an extent that their identity has been diluted with the identity of the disbelievers. Because the system the existing system worldwide is working hard to do this. Forget this nonsense. They claim to be democratic. Democracy, democracy, freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, freedom of individuality. This is a lot of, excuse my French, BS. Total nonsense. The greatest democracy, they claim, last month abandoned, uh, 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 prohibited little girls from wearing their abaya, from their wearing their Islamic attire. Not the head cover. No, no, just even the outer garment is prohibited. You have to wear skirts or jeans. Trousers. Where is the democracy? This is utter communism. Don't claim you're democratic. You want the people to be molded in what you choose for them. And there's no democracy in this. They're a bunch of liars, hypocrites. So they essentially want to mold the Muslims, to dilute their identity so that they don't have an identity of their own. They monitor masjids, lectures, preachers when they preach and they say anything that goes against the Republic, foundations and beliefs, they're extradited or put in jail. What's the difference between them and the Uyghur who are being prosecuted for their Islam? What's the difference between them and the Chinese who are prosecuting and persecuting the Uyghurs for their Islam? There is a same. Don't claim that they are democratic. They're a bunch of liars and hypocrites. And this is why most Muslims now are losing their identity. If you go back to the foundations of Islam, which all Kafir countries resist and undermine and try their level best to bring you down on your knees and humiliate you through their educational system, through their social system, through 
prohibiting you from using freedom of speech, which they brag about, you will find that they don't want you to learn your religion. Because if you learn your religion, if you go back to the Quran, to the Sunnah, they lose and you win. And Islam will prevail, whether they like it or not. In Islam, it's a crystal clear fact that we're ordered to have our own identity. Not to imitate the disbelievers, even in, in the slightest of things. Things that people would consider to be trivial and not of great importance. You see this? This is the mustache. In Islam, we're ordered to trim it so it does not go beyond the upper lip. And to trim it to the best of your ability, not to shave it, but to trim it really good. The Prophet said, والسلام, he who does not trim his mustache is not from among us. Whoa. It is similar to cheating. Who he cheats us is not from among us. A mustache is something trivial to the vast majority of Muslims, not in Islam. It's part of your identity. The Prophet said, honor the beard, prolong the beard, let go of the beard, leave it as it is. Go against the ways of the Christians and the Jews and the fire worshippers. And the vast majority of them, the Jews and the Christians and the fire worshippers, don't grow their beards. The Prophet وسلم, saw a man once walking with a garment that went below his ankles. And we know that this is a sin. So he said to him, uplift your garment. So the man looked at the Prophet said, and said to him, alayhi salatu wasalam, Oh, Prophet of Allah, it's a very torn, old garment. It's not a means of pride or showing off. So the Prophet said to him, alayhi salatu wasalam, Don't you have an example in me as a role model to you? The man said, so I looked at the Prophet's garments and it was to the middle of his legs. And this shows you that your identity is important even if you don't find any logic behind it. Abdullah ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with the man with his father, once came, as he narrates in Sahih al Imam Muslim, I came to the Prophet والسلام, with a two pieces of garment or suit that were dyed with saffron. So this is a dye that has a smell and a color. But this is not from what the Muslims wear. And this is something that the disbelievers are known to wear. Abdullah said the Prophet was angered by this when he saw me. And he said to me, Abdullah, did your mother order you to wear this? And this is a bit offensive shocking for a man to be addressed like this. Abdullah said, immediately acknowledged his mistake. He said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, should I wash them off and remove the saffron from it? The Prophet said, no, burn them. Why waste money? So that you would learn your lesson not to ever imitate the disbelievers. This is a glimpse of how important the identity is in Islam. And this is what the enemies of Islam don't want us to do. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the youngsters, and they're the majority of the Muslims, alongside with the elders, some of the elders, they've got dual personality, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, on one hand, they 
have Muslim names. Sometimes they pray. But on the other hand, if you look at them, you don't know whether they're Muslims or not. Fading hair styles. No beards. Wearing lots of amulets and rubber bands and colored wrist bands and necklaces, bling blings. Some of them even pierce their ears. And they don't have anything that would indicate that they're Muslims. Some of the Muslims even play music, participate in AGT, BGT, FGT, whatever. And they have Muslim names. So they don't know what Islam really is. And this is dangerous. When you lose your identity and you're torn between different identities, this may make you fall into hypocrisy. Listen to what Allah said about hypocrites in the Quran. Allah says, Verily the hypocrites seek to deceive Allah, but it is He, the Almighty, who deceives them. And when they stand up for prayers, they stand with laziness and to be seen by men. And they do not remember Allah, but little. They, the hypocrites, are swaying between this and that, belonging neither to those, nor to these, nor to those. They're not believe, belonging to the Muslims, the believers, nor they're belonging to the disbelievers. They're hypocrites and they are in between. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, And he whom Allah sends astray, you will not find for him a way to the truth and to Islam. So this is really scary. Now, come to think of it. What is the source of our identity? What is the source of our pride? Is it our beauty, our wealth, our authority, our power? Whenever you see a real practicing Muslim abroad, the first thing that comes up to your mind and to the disbelievers' minds, when you tell them, I'm a Muslim, what's the first thing that comes up to their mind? Oh, you're a person that does not eat pork. You do not drink intoxicants. That you pray, you fast Ramadan. And women wear hijab. This is the first thing that comes to mind. Why? Because this is their identity. So the source of our pride and our identity is Allah's religion, is the sunnah of our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. The more you follow the sharia, the more your pride goes up and increases because this is the only source of your pride, the religion. Allah says in the Quran, but honor, power, and glory belong to Allah, his messenger, and to the believers, but the hypocrites know not. These things belong to us believers because Allah granted it to us. And our pride and identity is manifested when we, fall, when we are committed to forms of worship. The Prophet said, remember that the believer's honor is his praying at night. My honor is when I pray to Hajjud at night. And his pride is in him being independent of people. My pride lies when I don't look 
to people giving me something. My pride is to be independent and not to look whether they're going to give me something or not. And this concept of honor and pride and dignity was well established with the companions. May Allah be pleased with them. And there are so many stories that we can spend the whole night saying, but the time is quite limited. Hakim ibn Hizam once bought the garment of the king of Yemen, the Yezin. So imagine the king of Yemen had a very fancy garment. So he bought it and gave it to the Prophet The Prophet accepted his gift and gave it to Usama ibn Zayd. Of course, we know Zayd was the adopted son of the Prophet before it was abolished and abrogated. So there was no adoption after the, afterwards. And the Prophet loved Us uh, Zayd tremendously as he was known to be the son of Muhammad. But when adoption was abolished, so he was called by his father's name, Zayd ibn Haritha. But the Prophet loved him as a son. And his son, Usama, the Prophet loved him as a grandson. So he was the love of the, uh, of the Prophet. The Prophet gave this beautiful suit, an expensive suit, to Usama. So Usama put it on. Usama, by the way, was black as night, while his father was white, Caucasian. So when Hakim saw this young boy who was in his teens, maybe like 13 or 14 years of age, wearing the garment and suit of the king of Yemen, he was astonished and shocked. And he says, you are wearing the suit of the king of Yemen? Look at the identity and pride of Osama, this youngster. He said, yes, why shouldn't I? I'm better than him because I'm a Muslim and he was a Kafir. And my father, Zaid, is better than his father. Hakim was amazed by this answer. And he went to Mecca, back to Mecca, repeating it to the people of Mecca and showing them the pride of this youngster with his Islam. Rabi ibn Amr, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the companions, enters the court of the leader of the Persian army that was just about to fight with the Muslims. And he said to him, Rabi, this Rustum, the, the, the Persian leader, said to Rabi, what brings you here? You Arabs used to eat dead flesh out of poverty. And you, eat, you used to eat uh, 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 beetles of the desert. You used to fight one another and assault one another, tri tribes, tribesmen so assaulting other tribes. And he started cursing and saying bad things about the Arabs. So he said, who are you people? What brings you here? Rabi did not come to this Persian leader with gifts, golden swords, or hawks and falcons, expensive jewelry. No, we're here to fight. So he said to him, Allah the Almighty had sent us so that we can take and free the people from worshipping other humans to worshipping Allah alone and to take them out from the tightness of this life to the wide prospect of the hereafter and to take them out from the oppression of different religions to the fairness and justice of Islam. So Allah sent us with his religion to his people to call them. Whoever accepts our religion, we leave him alone. And whoever refuses, we will fight him 
until we reach what Allah has destined for us. This is the attitude and identity of the Muslims. Unlike us, you and I, look at the Muslims today. They're scattered all over the world. Tourists. Partying all night long. Womanizing, drinking booze, spreading mishab and, and, and chaos and corruption in the world. And they are acknowledged as Muslims. While back then, they spread all over the world with their graves everywhere in the globe, calling to Allah Azza wa Jal. So they graduated from this masjid of the Prophet والسلام, which was paved with pebbles and had only palm leaves on top of it that would not preserve it and protect it from rainwater when it fell. It had nothing. But look what it produced. And look at our masjids with the marbles and the chandeliers and what it had produced. Now, what is the cause of this identity crisis? A number of factors and reasons and we're running out of time, unfortunately, but as I said, this is a very important topic. So what are the reasons behind this identity crisis? There are a number of reasons. Among the first of these reasons is the te technological advancement and being shocked how they've reached the moon, traveled in space, so much technology they have and possess and their upper hand in their military advancement. So this made a lot of the Muslims feel inferior and want to be like them. Also, secularism and the relentless attempts to destroy religion whether Islam or other religions, and to amplify and inflate the role of logic over Islam and what Allah commands. So nowadays you end up by people saying that, no, this is not logical. Yeah, but Allah ordered it. Exactly like when Allah ordered Satan to prostrate to Adam, he said, this is not logical. I was created from fire and he was created from clay. I'm better than him. Why would I prostrate? So he defied a direct order from Allah. And the vast majority of Muslims today are doing the same. They're going against the Quran and the Sunnah. Openly. Saying that it's not logical. This is uncivilized. And they have left the fall of Islam once they have done this. Also, as humans, we're weak. We love lusts and desires and things that makes us enjoy life, even if it's haram. So when we imitate the disbelievers, it makes getting and attaining these lusts and desires much easier. It's much easier to hook a girl or to involve and get involved in uh, um, drugs and, and intoxicants and boozing and maybe gambling and pursuing whatever you want from haram if you look and act like them. While it's much difficult if you look like me. And among the things that cause this identity crisis, the media especially social media. So when they portray someone like me wearing the Islamic attire or the Arab attire, not necessarily Islamic, having a long beard, what does the media say about the likes of me? Terrorists, uh, um, retard, uh, 
um, uncivilized. And the Muslims, they listen to this. And some of them say, hmm, that's true. And this is very unfortunate when such ignorant imbeciles fall to such traps of the media and the social media and the likes where they tarnish the reputation of Islam. So they feel inferior and they start to lose their identity and rather be like the disbelievers. Even if they have to wear a cross or have tattoos on their bodies like so many Muslims are doing now, not knowing that they're being cursed for this or knowing, but they brush it off. It's trivial thing. We will go to a Jannah before all of these people. They say they, they think and they believe. So how to cure this identity crisis? Again, the time is very limited, but number one, you have to sense and feel the blessing of and favor of Allah upon you for being a Muslim. Don't be a Muslim by identity only card, ID card. This doesn't does, do you any good. Written in your passport, Muslim, or in your ID card, Muslim, doesn't have any significance. It's walking the talk that does. And when you feel that you're blessed for being a Muslim, you'll preserve your identity. And if you feel that no, it's not a, a huge blessing, then you'll start to compromise your identity. And if someone comes to you and says, hey, uh, you look Hispanic. Hola, ¿qué pasa? You feel happy. Oh, alhamdulillah, he thought I was Hispanic and not a Muslim. I was afraid that he would recognize me to be from the Middle East or from the Muslim community. But alhamdulillah, he thought that I'm Spanish or this or that. This is pathetic and it brings sadness to our heart if you want to cure this illness and to preserve your identity you have to learn your religion no one with knowledge of his religion from Quran or Sunnah or the biography or the seer of the Prophet no one has this knowledge and would lose his identity you need to learn what your Islam is not valid without. The essential, not to be a scholar, but to the basic minimum, the bare minimum. And this is what makes you steadfast at times of tribulations and calamities. You have to call others to Allah. Because if you're proud of your identity, you're proud to call others to Allah. So many people are ashamed of their identity. They don't even have the guts to pray in an airport or in college or at a school or in a mall when the time of prayer is due and it's about to go out. They're afraid. Nobody's going to harm you. Yeah, but uh, what will the people say? So you have to call others to Islam. You have to be proud of your Islam. The, Allah says in the Quran, and who is better in speech than one who invites to Allah and does righteousness and says, indeed, I am of the Muslims. Thirdly, you have to fear that you might be a hypocrite, a full-fledged hypocrite. This fear of being a hypocrite means that you're not a hypocrite. Because... Whoever is secure and safe from feeling hip a hypocrite, he's a hypocrite. And whoever fears hypocrisy, then he is a true believer. Ibn Abi Mulaika from the Tabi'een, rahimahullah, says, I have met 30 of the Prophet's companions. May Allah be pleased with them. All of them is afraid that he might be a hypocrite. And none of them says, my Iman is as strong as the Iman of Jibreel and Mikael. Finally, a lot of us may complain that, Sheikh, there are 
so many pressures against us. The whole world is against us. And we don't know what to do. It's, it's, it's overwhelming us. My friend, a Muslim has no other choice either to remain steadfast on Islam and show his identity and be proud of it or to blend in and to agree to be diluted in this melting pot until he comes out of his religion totally. Like Allah described the hypocrites by saying they are swaying between this and that, belonging neither to these nor to those. And at the end, the choice is yours. Either to be a Muslim culturally, a Muslim by inheritance, by lineage, or to be a Muslim through conviction and practice. And this would preserve your identity and the identity of your children. There is so much to say, especially about those living abroad and how to preserve their children's identity to the best of their knowledge and ability. But as I said, the time is very limited and we've already exceeded the half an hour margin. So I pray to Allah that he grants me and you and all our viewers and all those who listen to this to grant us the ability to remain steadfast on Islam and to gain the knowledge that would enable us to call others and to clarify their doubts about Islam and to be proud of our identity and of who we are. And no matter what they say about you, dogs that bark don't bite. When people accuse you or abuse you or try to put you down, do what you do when you meet a dog in the street that barks at you. Don't fall on your hands and knees and bark back. Rather stand tall and walk away ignoring it. And Allah knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Jazakallahu khairan, Shaykh. Barakallahu feek for your time. Barakallahu um, khairan. Insha'Allah, we will be taking questions. And uh, I've got a few good questions over here. Uh, Shaykh, the first one says, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Jazakallahu khairan for your input. What is your recommendation for the situation in India and other places where it's becoming tough for us Muslims? Should we migrate to other safe places in the world, even though they're non-Muslim countries? The people of India are a minority compared to the rest of the population. But they are almost 200 million, which makes them one of the largest communities for Muslims worldwide, other than the Muslims in Indonesia, for example, who are over 250 million. So if we were to ask them to migrate, that would cause a vacuum. And to tell you the truth, non-Muslim countries are not better than India. So with all the, what is happening, the lynching and the killing and the torturing and the humiliation, compared to what happens abroad, this is not a lot. And this is why the vast majority of Muslims are safer in India than outside. Yes, there are certain areas that it is too hostile and dangerous. And in these particular areas, the Muslims should evacuate and relocate to other Muslim areas 
And this is what I always tell the Muslims, to reunite and to try and live together next to one another, to watch each other's backs. When you live scattered in different neighborhoods and you're the only Muslim family among thousands of non-Muslims, you will be eaten alive. You will be eaten alive. But when you are a thousand Muslim families watching for one another, living next to one another, they would think twice before even attempting to do something against the Muslims. So the Muslims should cluster and gather in their own villages, their own neighborhoods, and build a strong community around the masjids. This is the right way of doing it. And inshallah, Allah will protect them by that. Uh, uh, the next question is, how to preserve your identity when your own household is non-practicing and pressuring you? The Prophet وسلم, was sent in a similar environment. He was on his own. And he started building alliances and followers. So Mother Khadija, his wife, accepted Islam, the first one. Abu Bakr, his best companion, Zayd ibn Haritha, his adopted son, and Ali ibn Abi Talib, his cousin. So when you're alone, you try your level best to focus on getting people who will sympathize with you and accept, if not practice with you. If you fail to do this, then there is no other alternative by preserving your identity for the sake of Allah. Always remind yourself, why am I doing this? Because I love Allah. Why am I doing this? Because Allah ordered me to do so. Why am I doing this? Because this is the way of the Prophet ﷺ, which I'm following. So I could care less what people say. As long as Allah is, hap as, uh, as long as Allah is pleased with me and with what I do, this is all what counts. <laughs> Next, uh, people living in the West try to maintain their Muslim identity. At the same time, they feel the need to wear normal culture clothes to blend in with society. How do we balance these two attire, Sheikh? Do we stick to our thawb or abaya or wear Islamic dresses, Islamic dresses while blending with culture? There is nothing wrong, none whatsoever, in wearing halal, permissible clothes. So this thawb I'm wearing is not an Islamic attire. This is an Arab attire. The Prophet used to wear the Qamis, which is a much shorter uh, um, uh, shirt, like the Pakistani wear. This is more closer to the Islamic attire than anything else. The Saudis, or what I'm wearing, the, the Arab attire, is a cultural thing. This is, the Prophet never wore this. He used to wear the turban. So it is not advisable for people living in the U.S. or in, in Europe to wear the Arab coat, the dress coat, because this would make them look weird. And if you approach someone to give da'wah to, he would have an immediate resentment to whatever you're going to say, even if you're going to say to him, here's 100 euros, because it's coming from you. When I travel, and people know this, I wear normal jeans and a t-shirt. There's nothing wrong in that. It's more convenient for me. I tend to blend in <laughs> with my beard. I don't think I'm going to bl ever blend in. But again, it looks okay. And if you are a student of knowledge and you want to give a khutbah in a masjid, or you want to lecture your friends at school, but you look different than them, though you are from the same country. So you were born and raised in that country and you always wore trousers and suits and t-shirts and shirts. What made you change? Well, because I become a Muslim. Islam doesn't tell you to change your attire like this. Islam tells you not to wear haram clothes. So you don't expose your aura, you don't wear tights, you don't imitate the disbelievers. Nowadays, wearing trousers and a t-shirt or a shirt or a suit is not imitating the disbelievers because 
the vast majority of Muslims wear this as their day-to-day -day clothes. So there's no imitating the disbelievers when we wear this and Allah knows best. Feel free to ask whatever you want. If you have doubts or something you did not like, go ahead, Yahi. You can comment. I don't hear you. I've lost your, your voice. You're muted, maybe. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, there is uh, one more question that says, what should be the approach for children who are being confused with difference, with differences within the household and the masjid community with respect to the beliefs and rulings which are obligated in Islam? Depends who's teaching them. If, if you're talking about a parent in the house who's telling them about Islam and what's right and what's wrong, they should be aligned with the masjid. There's no difference in that. But if the masjid is teaching them Islam and the household and the parents and the siblings are all teaching them against that, the children are definitely going to be confused. And if Allah does not guide them to listen to the right sources of information in the masjid or by scholars and the likes, they're, they're going to be lost like their parents and their siblings. Um, Jazakallah khairan. There was one more. There was one more. Um, even though I identify as a Muslim, I struggle with being religious, with, with being as religious as I want to be. What are small but effective steps I can take towards being a more identifiable and more reliable Muslim? Akhi, this is something that needs to change a whole lifestyle rather than few tips. Because if you want to be identified as a Muslim and to increase your Iman and to be proud of your religion, first of all, you have to transform your life into what pleases Allah, beginning with your house. So again, we don't want Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde in our community. We don't want you to go to the masjid and pretend to be a practicing Muslim. And when you go home, you're engaged with Netflix and Game of Thrones and uh, uh, listening to music and wasting your time over haram things. You will never ever have your identity because you keep on seeing this filth and you keep on hoping, when will I be like this? When I will fall into such things and, and, and be famous or the likes. Secondly, Look at your contact list on your phone. You'll find that only one or two practicing Muslims are there. And the rest are all dunya. Uh, um, and, and people that are not something to be proud of associating yourself to. So you have to go to the masjid. You have to stick to the community and hang out with righteous practicing Muslims 24 hours, seven days a week. Otherwise, your heart is a vessel. If you don't fill it, fill it with goodness, it's definitely going to be filled with corruption and sins. So once you put this in your system and you hang out with righteous practicing Muslims 24 hours, seven days a week, only then you will see transformation on yourself, on your body, on your aqidah, on your thinking, and you will have this identity to be proud of, and Allah knows best. Um, Sheikh, are you up for more questions? Sure. You got eight minutes. Okay. Um, we have one question that says, "What is the bare minimum length? Bare minimum length of beard to have?" I think. The brother said, shoot, I don't want to have a beard like as long as the sheikhs. Akhi, it's an issue of dispute. The vast majority of scholars say that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ stated that, leave it. Hmm. So he said, All of this is just leaving it, not put weights on it every night so that it becomes longer by itself. No, no, no. The Prophet did not tell you to prolong it. He said, leave it. You don't have to put fertilizers or special uh, uh, chemicals to prolong it, as it is. Now, 
the Prophet himself والسلام, had a very big beard, huge in its width, to the extent that the companions could tell when he was reciting in silent rakaz by the trembling of his beard from seeing him from behind, which meant that he had a huge beard, which he did not touch or trim. The other opinion says that due to the action of Ibn Abbas, uh, uh, of Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that whatever exceeded the fist length, he used to trim it. And this was in the Hajj season. Because in Surah Al-Fatih, Allah says, you shall enter the Masjid Al-Haram in safety, shaving and shortening. This refers to shaving the head, if you wish, after Umrah or Hajj, or shortening and trimming your hair, if you wish. So he understood it to be shaving the head and trimming your beard. So he used to do this in Hajj. So this is the other opinion is that if it, is more than a fist length, you can cut it short. Unfortunately, today, people don't do this. They do it from the top of the fist, not from the bottom of the fist. That's why it never ends. If they keep on trimming it and cutting it short. So the, the opinion that I'm inclined to, which is the opinion of my shuyukh, bin Baz, bin Athameen, and the likes, they say that you leave it as it is. Now, in extreme cases, and this is rare, when you have your beard reaching your belly button, this becomes hazardous to your health. So when you eat, you start eating your own beard because it's everywhere. When you drive, it comes to your eyes and impairs your vision. Or it, if you're working in a factory, imagine it falling into the machine and you have a big problem. This case, yes, when it's hazardous, this hazardous to your life, you may shorten it to the fist uh, um, length, and Allah knows best. Um, Sheikh, uh, there's one teacher of mine who would like to ask you a question. Sure. Just... Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa uh, getting old, alhamdulillah. How are you doing, Sheikh? Barakallahu feek, wafaqik Allah. Shukran, shukran, jazeelan, Sheikh. Sheikh, just a very quick question. I know your time is about to come to an end. And I know very well, it's a question that I've been getting as well, but it's been a little bit challenging for many people uh, in the West. Speaking about identity, Sheikh, uh, we know very well that the syllabus in school in the West is being structured to put doubt in our children's identity, not us. Mm. We've grown mm. up with good tarbiya. And like, mm. like how you mentioned with the contacts we're having, the kids, the social media and all, you know, when they go to school, Ajib, subhanAllah, the syllabus has been structured, letting them understand that it's okay for mm. to lose your identity. You know, Shayla with Chantel and Paul with Smith, it's okay to do that. To the matter of fact, sometimes they, they have parents meeting Mom and dad supposed to come and then they see two male coming in, my mom and my dad. So our children are being exposed to this and they're confused. So the parents in the West, they tend to remove their children from the school. But now with the new law, if you don't bring your children to school, they bring social services to you. It's very challenging for the parents to actually save that identity and save God and preserve that Muslim identity. What's your advice to those parents? Make hijrah? or keep their kids in the house, or bring them and make proper terbiya to them. We really would like to hear that from you, Sheikh. This requires another lecture, Akhi. First of all, <laughs> I know. it is a priority for Muslims to preserve their religion and their identity. Mm -hmm. And scholars say that if a person is capable of practicing his religion without any interference, without any oppression, without any hindrance, they may stay and live in the disbelieving countries. But if there is oppression or they cannot perform their normal rituals, such as hijab, then it becomes mandatory for them to migrate if they're able to do this. Now, unfortunately, migration is not 
possible to the vast majority of Muslims, either due to economic reasons or political reasons. But alhamdulillah, there are countries that are more lenient than others. So such as these countries that prevent you from wearing the hijab or the abaya, such as France, any white beat around the bush, who claim to be democratic, and they're a bunch of liar hypocrites. They're not democratic. They are socialist communists enforcing whatever they want upon the people, and the people are like stray sheep. They just do what they're told. And they can't say anything else. And rather, some of them even ride the wave and support their government in such evil behavior. And I was talking to a brother a few days ago, and he was telling me that the social services are going to intervene. Intervene in what? No one knows what's best for my children more than me. I wouldn't believe legislators. I wouldn't believe the president himself when he says that, no, this is best for your children. You're a, yani, I, I can't use profanity. This. <laughs> I would, otherwise, I would have done that. But this is a lot of nonsense. Nobody cares for my children more than me. And when you come and enforce your beliefs that are corrupt and that are spreading uh, um, all kind of, of, of nonsense in the society. Look at your children. Look at your girls. Look at your boys. Boys are turning girls. Girls are turning boys. And you're teaching them sexual education, sex education at, at an early age of eight or nine years of age, how to use condoms, how to use vibrators, how to use dildos. And, and, the, and then you say that, oh, this is for the betterment of the, the children's health and, and, and knowledge. This is a lot of BS. And this is why Allah is little by little showing them his wrath. They're being kicked out of uh, uh, Africa after they've taken all of their natural resources, uranium, gold, and this and that. Every African country is kicking them out. And they are going to be facing a lot of trouble because of their injustice. Not from us. Allah Azza wa Jal would show them his wrath. When the government itself and the country itself is going to collapse with, from within. So what to do? I told the brother, Akhi, you as Muslims should have collaborated and formed many, many private schools that are, are, are private for the Muslims, segregated through their legal system, through their educational system. But then they cannot enforce such rulings because it's not public schools. If this is not possible, they should migrate to other countries, European countries that are more tolerant to this if they cannot find any Muslim countries to take them in. But whenever there's a will, there's a way. They also, as a community, have to challenge this. Where are the Muslim lawyers? They're getting richer and richer, but they're compromising their religion. No, devote some community time for the sake of Allah and file lawsuits in the European Community Council in, in your own country against such injustice. And do it for the sake of Allah. If the Muslim lawyers collaborated on this, wallahi, they will turn it over. So there are many ways, but who am I to speak about it? I'm here in, 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 in Arabia, knowing nothing, and alhamdulillah, not suffering like they're suffering. But I pray to Allah that he makes a way out for them. Wallahi, it's, it's, it makes my heart bleed to see the Muslims weak, uh, ununited, and to see these disbelieving government and authority not only control the Muslims, but they control the masjids and telling them what to say and what not to say and not to, to cross their lines and then say that's a democracy. No, no, it's, it's not democracy. This is a lot of BS. Sure.
شكرا شكرا بارك الله فيك شيخنا بارك الله فيك for joining us as well great great pleasure as usual بارك الله فيك from my side and اعلم انني احبك في الله وجزاك الله خيرا وجزاكم وحبكم الله الذي احببتمونا فيه and i believe that we've come to the end of our journey tonight i pray to allah that he makes all of us steadfast on islam that allah makes us increase in knowledge of his, his quran and the sunnah and to abide by them and i pray to allah that he gives us the true islamic identity that he's pleased with and that would makes us would make us among the chosen one with the grace of allah i mean ya rabbi i mean jazakallah khairan sheikh thank you so much for your time inshallah this one is for the people who are staying we have a little segment to inform you about the global learning academy so inshallah we'll just get to that barakallahu feek sheikh barakallahu feekum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah um dear students of the global learning academy <clears throat> so we'd like to thank the sheikh once more jazakallahu khairan sheikh for that amazing talk we would like to take a couple of minutes of your time to inform you about your journey towards knowledge. A gentle reminder that age is no reason to stop learning. Well, we are here to offer you that pathway to knowledge. The courses we offer are as so. Let us show you what we are offering. We, we are launching our Medina program level two. After successfully completing the Medina program level one, our beloved Mashayikh are providing us with another opportunity for level two. This program consists of live classes, assessments, and a signed diploma from our Mashayikh. This course consists of live classes by the scholars of the Medina University. We offer the syllabus, we offer the level two syllabus for the subjects of Aqidah, Tafsir, Hadith, and Fiqh. Here, our, here is our prestigious lineup of shuyukh for the English program. For starters, we have our beloved Sheikh Ayal Hausi uh, for Tafsir and Sira. Then we have Sheikh Abdullah Sulaiti for the faculty of Hadith, Sheikh Muhammad Aslam for the faculty of Aqidah, and Sheikh Zulfiqar Ibrahim for the faculty of Fiqh. Next is our lineup for the Urdu program. For the Urdu program, we have Sheikh Abdul Ghani for the faculty of taf uh, Tafsir, Sheikh Arshad Bashir for the faculty of Hadith. Sheikh Ilyas Azmi for the faculty of Fiqh, Sheikh Sufyan Abdul Aziz for the faculty of Aqidah, and Sheikh Parvez Nakwa for the faculty of Sira. Admissions are now open for those who are interested in pursuing this path. For those who might wish to learn but cannot commit to a big project, we have the subscription models. We have Sheikh Ayab Hausi with story nights, with gripping parables from the Quran and Sunnah. Then we have Sheikh Muhammad Aslam with the names of Allah, in which you can delve deep into the beautiful names and attributes of the master of the universe. Then we have Sheikh Dulfiqar Ibrahim with Quranic reflections. This course consists of carefully selected passages from the Quran for tadabbur and tafakkur. <clears throat> Lastly, we have Ustad Hussein with the Quranic Arabic program in which you can dive in to the understanding of the Quran through the lens of the Arabic language. We also provide monthly courses such as Quran reading for all ages, a hifth program to memorize at your own convenience and at your own pace, a tafsir program with a power packed Tajweed, uh, a Tajweed program with a power packed Tajweed. Then we have the Teen Deen, a carefully structured Tarbiya course for teenagers and young adults to help groom our youth into becoming strong, steadfast, and focused members of this Ummah. The faculty in charge of these sessions are Sheikh Ayad, Ustad Hussein, and Ustad Anzalna, and many, many more prolific tutors. Ever wish your child could have, have a holistic understanding of the Deen? then you need not look any further. In this program, along with general Islamic content, we cover akhlaq, tarbiyah, and adab in order to help you groom your child into the ideal youth of tomorrow. 
We also provide a spoken Arabic program, which helps us master communication skills in the Arabic language. We also have some courses that are going to be started soon, such as the new Muslim program, understanding your Salah, and Iman boosters, and monthly guest lectures as we had today. For more information, please screenshot this slide. You will be receiving all this information after the program has ended. Please reach out to us if you wish to know more bi We would like to we would like to also add that the Global Learning Academy has an online school that provides quality Cambridge education all across the globe. For those who wish for the recording of this session, please reach out to the admin and they will provide it to you inshallah. Jazakumullahu khairan dear viewers. But before we close, I would like to remind you of a hadith that our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated. It states, An Abi Hurayrata radiallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman, sahalallahu lahu tariqan ila al-jannah. That narrates, Abu Huraira narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, whosoever takes a path upon which to obtain knowledge, Allah makes the path to paradise easy for him. And with that, we end uh, with the dua, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik, nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk, barakallahu fikum for your time, wa jazakumullahu khayran, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.